NASA's Artemis I mission and its unmanned Orion spacecraft are designed to demonstrate our commitment and capability to extend human existence to the moon and beyond. We've shown we can live in space, and we've had people living on the space station for more than 20 years. Now NASA wants to show that we can live in deep space on the moon and use that as a stepping stone to eventually get to Mars. But there are several challenges we're going to face before we get there, and they're not going to be easy. The first challenge of any space program is money. NASA's current SLS rocket is non-reusable, but new commercial space companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are building rockets that are reusable. We're still in the early stages of a self-sustaining commercial space economy. Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin's founder, owns the Washington Post. These companies rely on NASA and the government uh, to a great extent. Uh, the difference now is that NASA is really comfortable outsourcing key parts of these missions to the private sector. I mean, remember, it is SpaceX that flies NASA's most precious resource, its astronauts, to the International Space Station, and it's entrusting SpaceX for that first mission to land the astronauts on the lunar surface. And that is a sea change. Once you've funded your mission, you have to decide what to bring and how to get it to space. That means supplies. The most we've ever landed on the moon with an Apollo mission was about 30,000 pounds, and that included everything, the lunar module, equipment, crew, fuel, oxygen, and food. To supply five or six astronauts for a six-month or longer expedition requires sending hundreds of thousands of pounds of stuff into orbit. The good news is that the rockets in use today, like NASA's SLS or SpaceX's Falcon Heavy, are much more powerful than the retired Saturn V. But the key is to create a sustainable presence, is not to hoist all that stuff from the surface of the Earth and bring it with you all the way to the moon. What you want to do is to be able to live off the land. It's called in situ resource utilization. And what we now know about the moon that we didn't know during the Apollo era is that there is water on the moon in the form of ice and the permanently shadowed craters, which is an enormous resource. Lunar ice can provide water for human habitation. The oxygen and water molecules can be used for air, but the hydrogen and oxygen in lunar ice could also be used for something else, rocket fuel. And therefore, the moon becomes this gas station in space that allows you to go further into the solar system, into deep space, perhaps even onto Mars. The moon itself can also be used to build a livable habitat, moon brick by moon brick, using the lunar regolith, or the rock and dust that covers the moon's surface. There are some studies that are being done to use the, the lunar regolith and use it to sort of to 3D print uh, off it and that you bring a 3D printer with you and build what you need in space. Okay, say we funded our mission and figured out how to supply it. There's still a danger lurking in wait for us, something so humble you might not even consider it, but it could be a deal breaker. Moon dust. Moon dust isn't like Earth dust. There's no wind or air on the moon, so there's no erosion that would break down the rocks into smooth, soft dust. Lunar dust is jagged and sharp, like broken glass. In addition to that, because the moon is airless, but there's no atmosphere, so it's just, the whole surface is blasted by solar wind, plasma, and solar radiation. So dust is charged. The whole surface is charged. So those charging properly make dust virtually sticks to all surfaces. I have never seen so much dirt and dust in my whole life, ever. NASA has been working on a solution, though. It's called the Moon Duster. It zaps away moon dust using a beam of electrons. People hear about the electron beam, and it sounds very fancy, right? It's just like light bulb. You have little tungsten filament in the light bulb, nice vacuum. Then you apply, you know, voltage to it. The first thing it does is it actually give out enough light out there. Uh, but another thing that comes out of that is electron beam. So when you turn on a little light bulb without glasses, and you underneath of that, there's dust. Dust it start charging up and start popping out from the surface. The duster appears to work very well against NASA manufactured lunar simulant, but it has yet to be tested in the field. Of course, you know, the best thing to demonstrate is go to the moon to demonstrate on the lunar surface. That's the ultimate goal. 
Let's say our moon duster works and we're not caked in lethal space dirt. Our final challenge might actually be the most intractable, and that's radiation. Both the moon and Mars are constantly bombarded with lethal levels of cosmic radiation from the sun and from our galaxy that we're spared here on Earth due to our planet's protective magnetic field. But once astronauts pass beyond low Earth orbit, they're exposed to ionizing radiation that can be damaging in high doses over long periods of time, increasing risk for cancer and degenerative diseases. Currently, NASA monitors space weather and the radiation exposure of its astronauts to make sure they're not exceeding exposure limits. On the Orion spacecraft, one safety strategy that has been tested is having the crew barricade themselves behind objects to hide from the sun's harmful radiation during a solar storm. Radiation on the surface of the moon for the astronauts is going to be a real problem, and that's something that NASA is working on uh, finding solutions for. And uh, on the Artemis One mission, we'll have test dummies on board the spacecraft with sensors to test radiation. Uh, they're going to need habitats to build that will shield them from radiation. Uh, maybe they'll be built uh, out of some of the lunar regolith. Some of them will be on the surface of the moon. Some of them might be under the surface of the moon, sort of digging out and building a cave. With the Artemis program, NASA has real momentum in getting astronauts back to the surface of the moon. There remain big engineering and political challenges, but with growing commercial and international partnerships, human expansion to the moon and beyond is just getting started. We've seen so much happen in just the last few years. Restoring human spaceflight from U.S. soil, the Mars Perseverance rover, the James Webb Space Telescope, and now the Artemis program, and a push to get humans back to the surface of the moon. I do think that in 30, 40, 50 years from now, we will look back at this time as a significant moment in the history of human space exploration.